So thank you everyone for coming today, whether you're joining us remotely or here with us in the room. I'm Rebecca Cummings. I'm the Interim Director of Digital Matters. And before I turn the time over to our presenter, I do want to make one quick announcement. And that is that it's that time of year again where we're accepting applications to the Digital Matters Fellowships for fall 2023. So the deadline for that is March 31st. If you have an idea for a digital project that you'd like to see funded, please do feel free to reach out to me. So without further ado, I am so pleased to announce our speaker for today, who is Dr. Kaylee Alexander, who is an ACLS Emerging Voices Fellow um, and also in residence right now in Digital Matters. Uh, Kaylee has her PhD in art history and visual culture from Duke University and is currently teaching data visualization and culture here at the University of Utah. Kaylee's talk for today, as you can see, is Death by Data, Auditing the U.S. Cemetery Landscape. Please join me in welcoming Kaylee Alexander. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank everybody for joining today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, a really new project, uh, if I knew, you know, the starting in the fall of 2022. Um, so it's definitely a work in progress. And um, I'm gonna give some background into what led me to this project, talk a little bit about the early process and methodologies that I'm using, um, and then hopefully a little bit of result, but we'll see. Um, and I'm always you know, open to comments and questions and suggestions at the end of the talk. Um, there we go. Um, so the project that I have started here in Digital Matters, uh, I'm, you know, calling for now at least the U.S. Cemetery Audit, and you see we've got our lovely Salt Lake City Cemetery there representing this project for now. Um, this project um, is in part inspired by uh, the Monument Labs Monument Audit that came out about two years ago. Um, they basically did a, a survey of all the monuments in the U.S. trying to look at the different demographics that were um, represented in uh, public sculpture in the United States. And I thought, well, why can't we audit the cemetery landscape as well? And what would that mean? Um, so a little bit of background on myself uh, and how I came to this, um, because I am an art historian. What is an art historian doing studying, um, you know, cemeteries as these kind of built environments? Um, but I, uh, I started uh, my PhD working on uh, French uh, cemeteries in the 19th century. Uh, my book is going to be out in August, so this is a little plug for that. It'll be on pre-order in July. Um, and what I was working on was really how can we study monuments that no longer exist in an aggregate form? Uh, in France, you're only guaranteed five years of burial, so over time, uh, there's a lot of missing uh, monuments, which gives us a very different view of the cemetery than um, you know, what we see if we go to famous places like Père Lachaise today. So I wanted to study these more vernacular forms uh, of non-elite individuals that didn't survive into the present, things that haven't been deemed cultural heritage, and try to see what those types of objects could tell us about um, people and how they were commemorating their loved ones in the 19th century. Uh, so I was really interested in survival bias and how to use data to combat survival bias. Of course, we're never gonna eliminate all of that bias, but um, at least working in the aggregate, we can start to see patterns and trends that we don't get in traditional forms of our historical research where we're looking at one or two objects in detail. Um, so I was using a lot of text-based sources as proxies for this uh, inaccessible material evidence. Um, we had books where I had records of 2,000 monuments, and I was like, okay, that can give me a little bit of a start. Um, and then I also, uh, because the French are really uh, meticulous about record keeping, I had burial records for everyone who had been buried in the city of Paris from 1804 uh, to 1972. I did not gather the data for that far. It was a lot of manual transcription. Um, but combining these different sources together, um, I was able to somewhat account um, for what monuments would have looked like in the 19th century and what the individuals who purchased them, uh, what their demographic makeup would have been uh, and how they were really perceiving um, you know, death and commemorative uh, action at this time, opposite uh, of elite individuals. Um, also, I've been uh, an editor for the Radical Death Studies blog uh, for the past couple of years. Um, so Radical Death, the Collective for Radical Death Studies is uh, an organization of both scholars and professional death workers working to decolonize death studies. Um, and they do a lot of different work in the intersection of very, different disciplines, uh, working with different geographies, but 
really trying to decenter the typical narrative of American cemeteries and burial practices from white European centric um, narratives. Um, so I was working with them, working on my French project. And then um, I also start collaborating with uh, the Friends of Gear Cemetery. Uh, Gear Cemetery is um, the first public African-American burial ground in uh, Durham, North Carolina. So that's where I was based while I was doing my PhD. Uh, and as I was finishing up my dissertation, they were getting ready to set up this exhibition in the cemetery called In Plain Sight. And they really wanted to give the history of the cemetery and show how the cemetery reflected the history of Durham's rich black community, uh, which was known in the era of Jim Crow for its Black Wall Street, uh, among other things. So um, my contribution to the In Plain Sight exhibition was really about how to mobilize data to study the cemetery in depth. Um, the cemetery is not in great shape. Um, they're still cleaning it up almost every weekend. They have cleanups, but there's a lot of work to be done still. Uh, there's not a lot of monuments available to us. There's about 200 extant monuments. Some have been uncovered recently as they've been doing more archaeological work in the cemetery. Um, but there's not a lot of physical evidence in the cemetery to go on to tell us the story of the individuals buried there. Um, that said, uh, the Friends of Gear Cemetery, uh, which kind of formed grassroots in the 1990s and then officially in 2003, has been working for the past 30 or so years to gather as much information on people buried in Gear Cemetery as possible. Uh, what this has taken the form of is a Google Drive folder with a lot of different documents, um, which at the time they were calling a database, um, but wasn't really searchable um, and it wasn't really useful in terms of studying people uh, in mass. Um, one of the things that they had been collecting, though, were these death certificates for every person they could find that had been buried there. And like I said, there are only about 200 monuments in situ, um, but by 2021, they had records for about 1,500 individuals uh, based on archive records um, and documents like this. Um, I see this and I see a wealth of data uh, that we can use to study the community uh, in various ways. Uh, so I went to Family Search, which is a nice, easy tool for tracking uh, death certificates. And they had uh, most, not most, they had more than the death certificates than the Friends of Gear had collected over time. And a lot of this information had been transcribed. Um, so I led a team to kind of scrape all this data from uh, family search, clean it up, and then add to it. Because as you can see, uh, not all of the fields that are represented on the death certificate were transcribed on family search. Things like the attending doctor, the hospital where the person may have passed away, um, the cause of death is not listed, for instance. Uh, even the names of the undertakers uh, are not transcribed here, but it are on the death certificate. And this was a really rich source of information. So uh, after scraping it, we kind of took to manual transcription, filling in all the blanks from the, the death certificate scans themselves. And we ended up building a database uh, for uh, mostly for descendants and genealogists to go and research individuals by name and get a little vignette about um, what that person's life might have been like. So their age, when they were born, uh, occupation, neighborhood they lived in, um, this kind of summary information. And then of course, leaving out what might be more traumatic information like the cause of death, uh, which often was a racialized category at the time. So we kind of wanted to keep that on the back end and uh, make sure people knew it was available if they requested it, but not make it so public and, and in your face here. Um, so what do we do with this next? Now we have a tool that ancestors and genealogists can use um, or sorry, descendants and genealogists can use to search for individuals, but I also wanted to deploy this as a, an aggregate study to try to figure out how we can study the cemetery as a microcosm of the city as well um, and get some more information because it had been seen as an elite cemetery um, and we wanted to kind of test if this was true or not. Um, so we started plotting uh, individuals that were buried in the cemetery and we wanted to give it this kind of humanizing effect as well. Uh, where it's not just a bar chart, uh, where people become increasingly anonymous, um, but really thinking about visualization techniques to humanize as well. So here uh, we have every individual represented by a square, 
uh, at the year in which they were buried. And this is an interactive visualization. You can hover over the block and get information about the individuals themselves, and then perhaps be prompted to go a little bit deeper. Uh, that said, we did want to, you know, build some basic charts to, to understand what's going on. Um, and like I said, we started with about 1,500 individuals. We ended up with over 1,800. The list is still growing. This is something we're still working on. Um, this is my data collection team here. Uh, and what this allowed us to do is really track the cemetery and what's going on. Um, there's no death certificates prior to 1909, so no information. We can't really say anything about those who were mostly uh, born during the era of slavery. We mostly have that kind of um, middle of Jim Crow era data. Uh, and then you can see that the uh, information starts to peter off after about 1929. Um, That's about when the city actually opens a city run uh, cemetery for African Americans in Durham. So people start moving to that location instead. And then the history of deer kind of stops there uh, in terms of burial history. Um, so we know a lot about this chunk of time period now. Based on the death certificates, we're able to look at different types of occupations. This allowed us to see that it was not such an elite cemetery. It was actually uh, demographically diverse, representing people from all different types of walks of life, from doctors to um, servants and, and whatnot as well. Um, so a, a much richer history of the cemetery came out of this, uh, which made me think, okay, we've done this kind of study of one cemetery using data and working in the aggregate. Um, how can I deploy this to study uh, the entire cemetery landscape of the US? So here cemetery, as an African-American cemetery, the records aren't super uh, well kept. There's no official register of burials. Um, and so that represents a deep gap in the history, whereas for a lot of white cemeteries at the time, we have uh, really detailed documentation to study individuals from. Um, so I wanted to see, is there a way to kind of pull as much information together as possible and maybe study um, how uh, different groups are underrepresented in the cemetery landscape? So that's the origin of uh, the cemetery audit today. So uh, questions, how can we study cemeteries on a large? aggregate scale. Uh, what might that aggregate study of U.S. cemeteries reveal uh, about access to burial or representation in burial spaces? So um, do the cemeteries and the people buried there and the communities uh, represent each other? So are local communities represented in the spaces of death that are uh, adjacent to them? And then uh, what methods could be used to undertake such a study? Uh, and that's a big thing for me. I'm really interested in the methods of uh, doing data-driven humanities work uh, and trying to find uh, humanistic solutions for uh, kind of computational humanities work. So uh, the data, uh, as many of you may know, there's lots of different websites out there for tracking uh, aerials. There's Find a Grave, Billion Graves, Interment.net, um, and all of these have really rich collections of data um, accounting for millions of burials uh, across the globe. Uh, ultimately, I wanted to keep my data consistent, at least at a starting point. Um, so I opted to just focus on find a grave. Uh, it's a well-known source of crowdsourced data. Uh, it was founded in the mid nineties uh, as kind of a hobby project um, for tracking famous graves. Eventually it became a much bigger data source. Uh, and since 2013, it's, it's owned by uh, ancestry.com. Um, they have uh, over 400,000 known burial grounds accounted for in the US uh, and over uh, 107 million individuals. Uh, this is considered one of the most comprehensive databases, though uh, it doesn't have as much information about the cemetery itself, which is definitely a gap. Um, but in terms of scraping the data, uh, the website's also got a pretty consistent format that made it easier to uh, collect the data from. Uh, so consistent web layout, and I'll discuss some of that in a moment as well. So the methods that I'm using, you can call it slow digital art history. This is a term uh, borrowed from Kuhn Rosens uh, at the University of Louvre in, in Belgium. Uh, slow digital art history is basically gathering data on objects over a long period of time. It's a project that continues to grow um, 
and doesn't have an immediate um, maybe result, but over time we'll have more and more uh, rich results to come. So very slow digital art history on this project. Um, then I'm using web scraping uh, to um, find a grave. So I spent the fall semester using Chrome's uh, web scraper extension to gather data on uh, 20 states oh. uh, in the US, including DC. Um, and I chose the web scraper because I'm not a coder. I come from a humanities background and I like the web scraper as a kind of first step tool for understanding how web scraping works and um, kind of a, a non-coding version uh, of getting your feet wet. Um, so I basically created two different selector charts, which you can see here, um, to grab the data. And what the web scraper does is I told it to look for the city, grab the name of the city, uh, then go into the cemeteries here, grab the names of all the cemeteries, and then for each cemetery, grab uh, again the name, the location. Sometimes it has coordinates, sometimes not. So that's something we'll have to think about. Uh, the cemetery ID, so I can always link back to find a grave and check the information. And then just the number of memorials there. So this is important because it's not the number of burials, it's the number of memorials recorded on this particular data set. Um, so this isn't really a question of how many people are buried there, but how many people have been recorded as being buried there. Um, I had to do a second scraper because as you can see, sometimes they have it broken down by city. Sometimes it's just the cemetery on that main level. Um, so then I created a second one to grab the name of the cemetery and then go in and grab the, the same information just on uh, two levels instead of three. Um, so then after grabbing all of that, of course, the state is very messy. Um, the web scraper doesn't allow you to grab everything in the most optimal way. You have to kind of grab boxes yep. of information. Um, and kind of the bigger the box, the more information you're likely to get correct the first time and not have to redo it. Um, but this means that the data needs to go yep. through a big cleaning process to make sure there's not too much uh, information in, in single cells. Um, so I use open refine here to split up the different cells, look at uh, the different components of the address, for example. Um, but I was also using this as a method of categorizing you. cemeteries. Um, you. So you can see the variables for context, type, cultural, religious, uh, cremains is a, is a binary variable um, representing whether or not the, the location houses cremated remains. You. Um, and these were all kind of built from text mining in the names of the cemetery. It's a perfect method, but if you, you search right for out. certain keywords, you can start adding these types of attributes and trying to understand if there's specific um, people that are being buried in certain spots. Um, so if it's a religious affiliated cemetery, it's a military cemetery is another one that came quite uh, often a lot uh, across. Um, what type of cemetery is it? So Please in cemetery mute. history, we have cemeteries, but we also have burial grounds and graveyards. Um, we have individual family plots and whatnot. So I wanted to get <laughs> that type of information. And then if it was religious, what is the religious group that's being represented? Um, if it's a specific cultural group that's being represented, I wanted to grab that as well. Um, for instance, you can see, if you just type in the word Baptist, chances are it's gonna be a religious cemetery. Um, so that was a pretty easy one, um, but it's a lot of trial and error too, because you have terms that will appear in, in multiple types of um, uh, titles. So for instance, me being Jewish, I thought, oh, if I type saint, that'll definitely be Catholic. Well, apparently it's not just Catholics that have saints. So that didn't work. I had to redo it. Um, also, uh, finding the Jewish cemeteries was a lot easier for me because I know the keywords to search for. So there's definitely some bias that's introduced there. That I'm going to have to um, you. reckon with as we go along. Uh, so the next step was trying to visualize this because now I have uh, yeah. like 90,000 yeah, cemeteries yeah. and I can't really comprehend yeah. all this information yeah. on its yeah. own. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You may have seen yeah. this on our yeah. advertisement uh, for the talk today. Um, so here I created uh, two hexile maps, one showing uh, the density of memorials, one showing the density of cemeteries. All the white ones I haven't gathered data for yet, so more looks like this, but that doesn't look like the US. Um, but just to give you an idea of what I have so far. Uh, and you can see states like New York have more memorials, but less cemeteries. States like North Carolina have the most cemeteries, but maybe fewer memorials. 
Uh, this is because in New York, you have a lot of big cemeteries with thousands and thousands of people. Uh, in North Carolina, you have a lot of homestead burials with maybe two or three uh, family members buried there. So this is uh, another thing they have to account for in thinking about um, you know, what, what this data actually represents. Um, using the individual locations too, you can plot them uh, in Tableau here and try to figure out what the different locations represent. Uh, I built a couple of dashboards, which you can access with the, the QR code if you're so inclined. Uh, this is a very, very beta version of the dashboards. Uh, just allows you to kind of explore a little bit the data, hover over the dots. You can see which cemetery it is. Uh, you can filter based on cemetery types. Uh, if you want to look at memorials versus cemeteries in the map on the right, you can. Uh, if you want to look at just religious cemeteries, you can do that as well and sort of get a, an idea of um, what's represented. Um, all right, so some very preliminary observations before I talk about how I'm going to completely change this project. <laughs> um, so uh, the first finding is reporting itself tends to be overwhelmingly white and Protestant. Uh, this is not surprising. This was also the finding that the Monument Lab found when they did their study of public sculpture. Um, this is probably less true of the actual site than it is of Find a Grave and the people who use Find a Grave, but I still find that to be an interesting uh, thought. Who is reporting whom is a really interesting question that I'd like to answer. For instance, we have a lot of indigenous uh, burial grounds that are recorded on Find a Grave, but then it says zero memorials. Uh, so what does that tell us about who is being accounted for and who should be accounted for? Um, so uh, that brings us to inequities in reporting and research attention. Um, some cemeteries, Greenwood in Brooklyn, lots of information. Uh, other cemeteries, like, I don't know, in St. George, Utah, not so much information on uh, you know, these pioneer kind of cemeteries. Um, so I need to reframe my research questions and definitely need to update my methods. Uh, and this led me to the question to code or not to code, which is the dilemma of digital and digital <laughs> histories. Um, so again, I am not a, a coder. I'm self-taught on all the technologies that I use. And when I teach too, I like to use technologies that are very uh, user-friendly from the start, kind of drag and drop systems that a nice programmer has made for us to use. And then I can revise later if need be. Um, but uh, at, while well, I was at Digital Humanities Utah this year, uh, I met Jesse Vinson, who's a programmer at BYU in their Department of Digital Humanities. And he basically said, well, you spent the whole fall gathering data and you could have done it in two days. And I'm going to help you do this in a much more efficient way. Um, but I still see the benefits of this kind of trial and error, right? Because you get to test different tools, you get to see how the technology works. And then you get to go and collaborate with people who actually know what they're doing and can refine the project. Um, so not all was lost. <laughs> um, so my next step is to throw out the 90,000 data points I have and recollect the data. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Jesse has written a Python script for me, um, which works with layout inconsistencies. So um, that means that I will be able to gather data, not just from find a grave, but eventually I can also gather from billion graves or interment.net and kind of sync the data up uh, to fill in gaps and missing information. Uh, it also scrolls automatically, so I don't have to go one page at a time, which is nice. Um, and I can gather more detailed information faster. So I was gathering just the cemetery level data, um, but now I can gather memorial level data too. So his test run, which took a couple of days and made me very angry. <laughs> we got, uh, you know, 54,000, almost 55,000 cemetery scrapes and index, almost a million different memorials across 118 uh, or 816 different counties. Um, and basically, uh, you know, this is the data that I was grabbing, just the number of memorials. But uh, with his scraper, uh, I can gather uh, this information too. Um, you can see there's, uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's a description of the cemetery. Not every record has this, so it would have thrown off my scraper if I tried to grab it for some and not for others. Uh, now I can grab it. Of course, this will lead to some information asymmetry as well, since places like Greenwood are definitely uh, more of interest to people and have more information. 
but it's still a starting point. Um, he's also, and you, I don't know if you can see it because of the Zoom thing there, but you can also grab uh, also known as and different names of the cemeteries, which again, wasn't at every single page, so I couldn't grab it before, now I can. And uh, then it goes into the view memorials, which I thought was gonna take me years and years and years to do, and it'll grab uh, the life dates of every person included in that view memorials tab. Um, and this helps me to answer one question that I wasn't really sure how to uh, address before, which is how do I add a time series to this data? Um, and maybe, you know, in the description, it'll say a founding date here and there, um, but ultimately that's going to be very rare in the scale of the data. Um, but with this memorial level information, I can grab first known burial year, which will allow me to kind of estimate when the cemetery opened um, and, and see how the development of the funerary landscape in the U.S. developed, um, you know, from the, the 18th century to the present, essentially. Um, so, recollect the data, <laughs> continue working on my categorization methods and levels. Once I have the uh, other known names of the cemetery, this might become easier as well because I'll have more information to go on. Descriptions too will uh, allow me to look for more uh, information and evidence about what type of cemetery this is. Um, also, I tried my hand at a little bit of topic modeling. Uh, it didn't yield very much. Uh, and it still needs a lot, a lot of work because 50 clusters is way too many to, to comprehend. Uh, but a couple, this is just topic modeling on the names of the cemeteries for now. Um, but a couple weird things do emerge. You can start to see that cemeteries are being called kind of consistent names. So Memorial Garden is something that comes up quite a bit. That's a, a mid 20th century kind of way of talking about cemeteries that denies death a little bit uh, in traditional literature. Um, but you can see here it's also associated with war and military cemeteries, and that's an interesting uh, decision if you're going to start calling it a memorial garden to cover up kind of the traumas of war. Uh, you can see also some religious uh, words that are clustering together. So what's going up, what are people calling Episcopal cemeteries, for instance? Uh, what, what do we know about evangelical cemeteries and so on and so forth? Uh, the Quaker one is interesting too. House is the number one. Uh, which makes sense because you have a meeting house and the cemetery is right next to it. So you can see the model is working quite well, um, but it will continue to refine once I have uh, more detailed data about the, the individual cemeteries. Um, yeah, so uh, next part two um, is to use the descriptions to find the first reported burial, of course, as I mentioned. Also going to welcome any suggestions on finding ways to account for area. Um, Justin Sorensen here found a great um, uh, data layer for uh, GIS that had all the cemeteries in the U.S., but it had almost half the cemeteries that I had, and it didn't have area included. So there's not that data out there, um, but thinking about how to account for area so you can really look at, you know, number of individuals buried uh, per square meter or something of that nature. Uh, are certain cemeteries more crowded than others? That's definitely a question uh, I'd like to answer. More visualization trial and error, apparently Python trial and error as well. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'll open it up for questions now, suggestions. Um, I know that was fast and not a lot of information, but um, hopefully it sparked something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation, Kaylee. Um, I think you're uh, at the at a really interesting point in this project. Uh, one, of, one of the questions that I had is um, simply, um, have you tried any other of the sort of repositories yet? I mean, it sounds like you've got a more robust way to, to capture more data from find the grave. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it'd be really interesting just to see like, you know, our different demographics yeah. using different typical methods, Absolutely. if at all, or different, you know, repositories or whatever. Um, so I'm just curious if you've, if you've taken a look at anything. Like I haven't taken a look yet. I know that internment.net tends to have more historical information about the cemetery, which I definitely want. Yeah. Um, but with so much information on the website, it's hard to tell from a glance which groups are reporting more on which. Um, they all tend to be used for genealogy. So they're built for that. They're not built for people looking at 
uh, all the cemeteries in the US. But um, no, that's definitely something I want to explore. Once I get the find a grave data scraped, um, you know, find space on a computer for all that. And then I can go in and get the other repositories as well. And yeah, definitely comparing the three would be interesting. But I need a team for that. <laughs> so, uh, team and money are, are working as well. <laughs> yeah. There was so much I found exciting about the Smithsonian Institute that I wanted to ask you about. Especially that you found such a good collaborator at BHU. I yeah. think that's like the point of why we do it. So it's really great to hear how you two connected and how Jesse's been able to help your research. But one question I have for you is Does Find a Grave know you're doing this? Like, have you corresponded <laughs> with anyone there? I have not. Uh, I know they're just in Lehigh, so I should probably do that. Um, and I've spoken to a couple of people who are like, Oh, do you know the founder? And I feel a little silly saying no. Um, so no, I, I probably have to do that though, so they know I'm taking something off their website. It'd be kind of interesting if you know at some point they had a link to your data set yeah. where other users of Find a Grave could interrogate your data set over time. I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely like, you know like to to make it something that anybody could interrogate over time because I have a set of questions, but there are endless number of questions that people can ask even looking at subsets of the data. Sure. On, on the sort of memorials page, were those hyperlinks for each individual name? Yeah, so, so you can- go to Ancestry profiles? No, those go to profiles on Find a Grave. Oh, um, but they they might link to documents that are then on Ancestry, okay. um, but to keep things anonymous, I don't wanna grab all that information. Um, I think the scraper will automatically grab their name and then I'll wipe it out and give it a record number. But um, yeah, what I'm interested in is just the dates for now. We have a question online. Yeah, if you want to take one of these. Um, so coming from, I think it's Hannah staff regarding size, monuments, and occupancy of the cemeteries. Will you try to account for, as an example, um, land burials versus mausoleum versus columbaria? I'm not sure what that is. Each with different numbers of interments and space. So for those who don't know, columbaria is where you kind of inter cremated remains, um, and those I have accounted for because some of the cemetery names include that there's a columbarium at that site. And so I've accounted for that uh, with like a binary variable that says yes or no, it's there. Um, in terms of accounting for memorial size, that's hard because uh, none of the sources I found actually give the dimensions of the tombstone. So without somebody going out and measuring everything, that's kind of difficult to say. Um, if I find a way to get the area of the cemetery, one thing I do want to do is calculate for density, because one of the things we found uh, at Gear Cemetery, for instance, was that um, Gear Cemetery was almost twice as um, crowded as the local white cemetery. So um, that's definitely a question uh, that needs to be answered and will give a lot of weight to this project. But again, this is very slow digital history. so. Um, it's going to take some time to get to that point, but it's a really important question. Yeah. Oh, just more of a mechanical question. Like, with oh. your new data <laughs> run, is it going to be too big for open refine to be useful to you? I don't know. I might have to chunk it up. Okay. Um, I've not worked with a data set that big yet. Uh, I assume I'm not going to be doing it on my laptop. Um, <laughs> and uh, I assume I will not be putting it all into Tableau either. Yeah. So um, I'll be yeah. I'll be so curious to see what you find out and if Open Refine is actually been yeah it, for that amount of data or not. I have no idea. I mean, already with the ninety thousand, it was moving pretty slow yeah. when I was using text filters. Yeah. Um, for doing like big batch changes, it's fine. Yeah. But I, yeah, I think I'm going to have to split it up and clean per state ultimately. Yeah. So if Cemetery is not a segregated cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to keep track of race or is that even knowable for some of the scraping? It's not knowable for public and religious cemeteries at large. Um, for instance, I do have a lot of cemeteries that are marked AME, so African Methodist Episcopal. For those who can assume that it's mostly African Americans buried there, um, there are some uh, burial grounds for the formerly enslaved as well. That we can account for. Um, so it's not perfect, but you can start to get at marginalized spaces of death. Um, there's also uh, asylums and institutional burial grounds um, that I'm trying to account for as well. But yeah, not perfect, but it'll give us some idea. That's good. Do the individual memorial pages on Find a Grave that maybe linked out to documents of the ancestry, do those indicate race at all? 
They could. I mean, a death certificate from you know the early 20th century would. Um, yeah, but then you, you have to think, do you want to go that deep and maybe violate privacy issues as well? Um, another thing we found with using death certificate data is there tends to be some really um, hurtful terms yeah. used, uh, and I don't want to replicate those traumas either. So it's it's a balancing act uh, that we're going to have to figure out as we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mind if I ask another question? Yeah. So another fascinating thing to me about this is, you know, there's sort of this debate in digital humanities centers. It's like, do you equip people to learn the digital tools or do you hire programmers to help them with their research? And I feel like you've hit this inflection point, like you spent a ton of time mm -hmm. learning digital tools, which has sort of been the digital matters um, system up to this point is we fund people to learn on their own. Whereas like BYU has a lot of programmers to help with their research. Yeah. Do you mind saying a bit more about like the pros and cons of each of those different so, systems? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think you need both, honestly. Um, I think having a programmer in, you know, proximity to you is something definitely necessary once you start getting to a certain point, uh, you know, down the digital humanities rabbit hole. Uh, there's definitely projects that don't need programmers. And my first step is always to try to do it myself without a programmer. Uh, so I at least understand the data that I'm gathering. Um, I found this too, you know, with going through the, the French burial records. Um, there are a lot of tools out there that'll, you know, try to OCR handwritten script, uh, but it's imperfect. And then I'm not engaging with the source as much, and I'm not getting that information as a historian out of it. Um, so I like to do this kind of combination of really easy tools, manual labor, and then when necessary, go to the programmer. Um, that said, working with Jesse is kind of in the middle as well. Uh, he's written the script, but uh, I'm working with him that he'll teach me how to run it. So now I've gained that skill as well. And then I can you know, engage with my data firsthand rather than having somebody else do it for me and then transmit it. Um, but I, I, you know, it's a delicate question. Everybody comes with different skill sets to digital humanities. Uh, and it's still even, you know, so many years now that it's been here, it's still kind of an emerging field, right? Um, and we don't traditionally train humanists in programming. So, you know, if you have somebody with a, I don't know, computer science and history background, that's great, but that's probably not what you're gonna have. But that's why digital humanities requires so much collaboration. So again, anyone who wants to work on this project, they <laughs> can email me. <laughs> it's definitely not something I can handle. Well, I mean, I'm I appreciate it like long-term NEH grants or something yeah. like that. Ideally, that would be, I would like to get a research group together to, to work on this. Um, so yeah, grants will probably be down the line. Do we have any more questions online or in the room? Anybody? 